Welcome everybody uh, to the Newton 1665 uh, webinar series. So today we have uh, an afternoon uh, of, of phase transitions. And uh, so we are happy to have as uh, the first talk, Kim Okranunayne. Uh, he will tell us about uh, very strong electric phase transitions. Please. Okay. So let's see how this, if I manage, so sharing. Now your sharing should be on. I go yes. to the full screen and I don't see my cursor. Okay, so we can't go to the full screen. This is perfect. Yeah, but I don't see what I'm pointing at. Ah. So I can see my cursor only if I'm not in the full screen mode. Okay, it's fine though. It's fine, it's good. Yeah. Okay, and that's the... All right, so, um, yeah, I was asked to give a talk on strong, strong transitions, and this is then mainly going to be some themes about the gravitational waves, electric barrier genesis, electric phase transition, and in particular calculation of techniques, and it's mostly going to be around this paper, which came out last year the validity of perturbative studies in the electric phase transition the two Higgs doublet model. And I'm also smuggling in a, a little bit, uh, one, one slide on this paper with gene electric barrier genesis at high wall velocities. Anyway, uh, when this paper on the uh, two doublet, two Higgs doublet model came out, Jim wrote me very quickly after that asking me, what's the probability that I come to be the first author in six author paper with my last name beginning with K. Now, instead of doing the probability calculation, I told Jim that there is this hierarchy in this, in this paper that the, that the probability of my being the, the first order is first author is much less than one, but however much larger than my role in the and, and my role in the papers, my achievement. So Honestly, this paper is, is, is mostly by credits belong to Lauri Niemi and Tuomas Tenkanen in particular and, and Ville and, and others. So I was in a rather, rather minor role. But anyway, that um, I tried to give you a, as good a talk on it as possible. And I saw that Ville was in the audience so he can uh, then, uh, answer questions, which I, I can't, in particular in the lattice uh, simulations. Now, anyway, let's move on. So... So, of course, we are all excited about the first order transitions. And, and uh, of course, the, the, the old Hubris hubri on this was the uh, electric barrier genesis possibly explain why we are here. And then, of course, the, the new interest is due to the gravitational signal in LISA, which presumably opens a new window to fundamental physics. And you might even be very brave and ask whether we can combine these two and, and may, make uh, use Lisa to, to learn about uh, electric barrier genesis or less uh, ambitiously about electric phase transition. Oops, I'm going wrong way. So uh, for a couple of issues here, practical issues involve this, you know, these different levels of strength what is strong depends on what, what, what aspect you are looking at. And if you are looking from the aspect of gravitational waves, uh, they favor really strong transitions with wall speeds, uh, wall velocities up to the speed of light, and very, which also makes the walls usually very thin. On the other hand, electric ba barrier genesis rather favors not really strong, but strong transitions with not ultra relativistic wall velocities. And typically they prefer also slightly wider walls for the efficiency. So these are kind of oppos opposing tendencies right away. And actually there are method methods issues as to the actual calculation of the barrier genesis yields for very, very narrow walls. Now, um, whereas, well, if you take the less, ambitious goal, you might ask about the electric uh, phase transition. What, what you can learn about the electric phase transition 
transition from the gravitational wave signal, what, what, what the info, information you get from possibly the fundamental beyond standard model theory parameters on it. And there the problem is that it actually turns out to be rather difficult to connect in many cases uh, these observations into those BSM parameters. And that's going to be what I try to emphasize that that is the case at least in, 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 in the model studied here. I think it's actually more generic. Of course, there's a philosophical issue which we don't not, none of us cares about much, but it is, there's still the point that none of this is guaranteed to exist because electric, while electric phase transition has to be there, its order can be whatever as far as the modern you know, universe now is concerned. And while barrier, barrier genesis has to be there because we are here, it doesn't have to be electroweak barrier genesis. And while gravitation waves certainly come from the early universe, they can be just very, very small. So we can just, just hope that there is something there to see, but there's nothing is guaranteed. So uh, here is a sort of a graph that I stole from a talk, recent talk by Lauren Yen in the vascular last year, which nicely, uh, it shows the uh, uh, the connectivity of, of these different topics, and and starting from here, this box, which is essentially the outer equilibrium physics, is, is, it, it concerns the barrier genesis computation of the barrier genesis uh, yield of the uh, of the barrier asymmetry, and on the other hand, the gravitational wave signal. These are both out of equilibrium phenomena which require their own specific uh, simulation uh, codes or, or, or Boltzmann codes for solving for the uh, uh, transport of particles in, in the walls. Uh, the relation of these into um, beyond standard model parameters goes through this sort of equilibrium thermodynamics box where we need to be able to uh, compute uh, lots of key key parameters of the phase transition, like latent heat, its critical temperature, or nucleation temperature for the bubbles, uh, the action, the rate of the nucle bubble nucleation rates, and the, eventually the wall velocities and widths from fundamental parameters, and 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 then hope is of course that that given a beyond standard model theory, somehow you you are able to hopefully very accurately compute via this box uh, the uh, predictions, good, good ac give ac accurate predictions for the barrier genesis and gravitational wave signals and by therefore constrain the beyond standard model theory parameters. This is of course the whole, but uh, I believe that the accuracy in this box is actually maybe stretching too far in particular in context with the gravitational waves. waves. So um, I, I guess maybe, you know, I didn't realize that I saw lots and lots of experts in, in, in the audience, hopefully since there are so many people in the, in the, in the loop, hopefully there are also some who are not that great experts so that they actually can benefit of a couple of slides that I have next, which are very, very trivial. Uh, so for example, this, uh, I now want to get back to a little more detail what's entailed into the barrier genesis calculation, and then I go to the gravitational wave calculation and eventually into this uh, <coughs> equilibrium thermodynamic simulation, but was first about the recap recapitulation recap of the electroweak barrier genesis program. The most important thing there is that there, there needs to be this bubble. This is actually a picture that I stole a long time ago from a long talk from Jim. I don't know where he stole it. Maybe he made it actually. Uh, but the early universe was very, very uh, peaceful place. It was really in good, very, very good equilibrium. So, so the only way to get out of equilibrium is the first order phase transition. This is of course, very long story. And, and, and if the transition is, 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 is strong, 
you may actually strong enough you can have first order phase transition and then you can have out of equilibrium condition right at the at the wall and and if the you know parameters are suitable it can be of the same order as the reaction rate and you can have a significant uh, departure from equilibrium so what's going on in this wall is that the particles get masses while you get in from the symmetric to the broken phase in the in the phase uh, transition there is a c and cp violation in the complex phases of the mass matrices and masses and somehow the barrier genesis mechanism then the cp violation leads to a leads to a particle uh, cp violating uh, transport of, of of particle asymmetry in, in front of the wall which eventually then biases the phalanges to to produce the baryon asymmetry because in the symmetric phase the baryon number violation rate is is, is, is large so the, the the thing is that this this kind of transport takes time so that's why when we say we want to have a strong first of all we want to have a strong transition but it can't be too strong because typically a very, very strong transition leads to wall velocities which go, are close to the speed of light. And then there's not much time for this diffusive process to go on and, and the yields get maybe too small. Of course, then while you get into the wall, into the bubble wall, this failure and rate has to, has to turn off. And, and, and this of course leads to this famous a condition that that the, uh, the the value of the uh, Higgs field divided by the temperature in the nucleation at the time of nucleation should be sufficiently large to turn off the, the sphalon rate and and this is the of course the condition for the strength of the transient this is what we mean this is the strong in the sense of electroweak baryogenesis so my clock is turning off all the time right um, so a little bit more accurately on what's going on in this electric baryon transport. There's a little bit of a busy slide. Uh, there's two different uh, known mechanisms for, for, for acronym quantitative computation of the electric charge transport uh, and the baryon number asymmetry. The first is called uh, this bed insertion mechanism, which is very popular. Uh, and gives large, you know, presumably because it gives uh, somewhat larger numbers. And then the other one is the semi-classical mechanism, which uh, has the slight edge of being a controlled expansion in gradients. Um, and, and so I give these results here only in the, using the semi-classical mechanism. And in the semi-classical mechanism, what's this uh, CP violation is, is explicitly present in a, in a force, effective force acting on particles, which is different for particles and antiparticles, because this uh, SK0 here is a number plus minus one, which is plus for particles and minus for, minus for antiparticles. So, so it creates a charge asymmetry separation within the wall, which then after diffusive processes uh, is projected in front of the wall and there creates the barriers as, as I explained the last slide. Now all, all belief here was that for this to work and Jim and I we were able to find at least that it tracks down to this old paper by Hewitt and Nelson in 1996 explicitly actually saying that for, for the diffusive processes to work you have to have wall velocities less than the speed of sound. That this is a necessary condition but that actually is not so. The diffusive processes are in no way um, related to the speed of sound and, and when we and and but interesting oh, it's a nice coin, funny coincidence that uh, that such a bound appeared to be there in the semi-classical mechanism due to a, a small wall velocity assumption made in driving the fluid equations by by ourselves with Jim and Michael Joyce and myself early at the end of the 90s and then later by both Stefan Huber and, and Dorsch in 2007. So this is just kind of coincidence in my opinion. However, when you are really write the fluid equations, dropping the non uh, small velocity assumptions so that they are valid also for the relativistic speeds, then you find out that there's absolutely no 
uh, nothing particular going on at the, at the wall velocity corresponding to the speed of sound. This is actually the old, this is this calculation from a particular model, a singlet model with a particular CP violation source. And here you see the result computed using the, uh, the small velocity assumption uh, fluid equations. And there indeed you see that, that it, it really drops like a rock when you, when you get the speed of sound. It, that, it also actually overestimated the, uh, the barrier in asymmetry at, at large velocities. And, but when, when you go to the full relati re fully relativistic form of the equation, you see that there's just a smooth, there's nothing particular going on at this point. Now, however, there actually is a drop which, oops, where did that come from? No idea. Uh, which is due to the fact that if you have in this picture the wall velocity shown is as actually uh, the wall velocity relative uh, of relative wall velocity relative to the plasma in front of the wall. That is not the real wall velocity measured, for example, in, in the in the plasma frame. The two are related by this formula, which is, which is from Spinoza and et al. And, and even for small, quite small deflagration, so here is the, the actual wall velocity, wall velocity, and then the curve here gives the, the, this uh, wall velocity appearing here. You see that, 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 that even rather strong transitions here, these, these curves are labeled by this parameter alpha, which is the ratio of the latent heat released to the uh, radiation energy density in front of the wall. So if this is a large number, the transition is very strong and there's a lot of energy pumped into the uh, plasma in front of the wall, which, which accelerates it and therefore the, the velocity difference actually gets to be uh, less than, than the actual wall velocity. So, so if I plotted this, replotted this figure uh, in, in this actual wall velocity parameter, it would go more like this. It actually should up first, and then there would be drop, oops, there would be drop, oh, I don't like this, I'm sweaty thing. Okay, I won't show it. Drop down, no, it, it really wants to follow. It would drop down right after the, uh, uh, at this um, speed of sound and then continue the deflagration curve. And this is an un annoying side effect. Okay, um, so let me now, and then, well, just a slide on the, what's the, in my opinion, what's the model building side of this game. So for, for many, many years, people, the, the, the in electric barrier genesis, the key thing was to look into the uh, uh, light, uh, minimal supersymmetry and in particular the light stop scenario. And I remember once a prominent physicist told me that supersymmetry cannot be disproved. It has to be, only, it can only be abandoned. And that kind of sparked me to, to coin this picture for the state of the art in the baryogenesis in the minimal supersymmetric standard model. So it's at least I abandoned this ship somewhat before it got this shape. Uh, now, anything, uh, this similar faith to my, seems to be uh, waiting essentially all models that rely on one step transition directly from say minimum at zero to somewhere, whatever in the field, you may have several, more than one field, if you like. Uh, which rely on, on large loop corrections, mainly given by this type of kind of correction to the, uh, to the zero Matsubara frequency. Uh, some activity is still observed on um, multi-Higgs doublet models. Although in my opinion, it seems that the, if the electric barrier genesis is the source for, for barrier genesis, it has to go to the dark sector. That seems to be where you have to go just because of the uh, strong CP violation constraints from, from ACME. But now, enough of barrier genesis. 
Now let's say, I say a few words of the gravitational wave signal, which is dangerous because I'm no kind of expert here. But there are a few words that I can say. First of all, I know that the solitary bubbles do not make any gravitational waves. So you, you can get gravitational waves only when you start getting bubble collisions or, the, or, or, or bulk motions in the, in the plasma. And gravitational wave signal, it's easy to see that the gravitational sig signal uh, it requires strong gravitational wave signal requires rather large wall velocities is simply because if you have a small wall velocity, then the plasma has enough time to absorb the, all the available energy and just to the reheating before the collisions and, and there's just really not, not, nothing much going on there. So you have 10 minutes. I understand. So simulations, the, another thing to understand is that the simulations of the gravitational wave signal always use effective phase transition parameters. These nice pictures created by, I forgot the, the uh, reference to Hindmarsh and others. Uh, they take typically the ratio, the vacuum energy released, the radiation energy released. That's the, the one of the key import, most important parameters. Then when the duration of the transition is obviously important, the longer it, it, it's going on, and the, the longer you are, producing gravitational waves from say sound waves or turbulence and then of course so and ob obviously it's you know the more vacuum energy there is the more 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 energy there is overall to be put into gravitational waves but in addition to that an important factor is this efficiency uh, coefficients for the energy transfer uh, to the bulk, bulk motions whether it be you now sound waves or turbulence or whatnot so and, and these efficiency coefficients are, are, are then, then strongly dependent on the wall velocities, which then also depend on issues like friction. And, and yeah, there was actually just yesterday, I think last week there was a paper by Thomas Constantin and others in which uh, a better, a new improved uh, calculation of this efficiency coefficients was given for the detonation. So, so this is uh, something which is being studied as we speak. But, and it's ob obviously clear that the bigger is the better. The larger is the, the there, are this, there exist lots of these fits, for example, for the gravitational wave, see, uh, wave energy density from the sound waves is proportional to these factors. You see that the longer the duration, the better, the larger, the ratio of the vacuum energy really the larger vacuum energy released there is the better and and the more efficient that you put the uh, energy into this uh, bulk motions the larger signal you get and and the thing is that to get an observably large signal you want these numbers to be half for example typically typically much larger than what you, what you usually had in the electroweak phase transition. Like for example, in the MSSM, before anybody was thinking about the gravitational waves, the typical number would be about 0.01. And now people want to have numbers like 0 0.15, 0 0.20 or so to get a good visible signal. So these are rather big numbers. So can we really connect them to fundamental model parameters? This may be somewhat tenuous. So and uh, so, so does a given fundamental model parameter set predict whether you have a def deflagration, detonation, or a runaway? Can you compute the friction? Can you really predict these numbers here that are being used to get the gravitational wave signal? Because if you can't, then you can't make the connection. And so, so the next, the rest of the talk, I, I want to uh, concentrate on a particular calculation where uh, these things are attempted to calculate, for example, the alpha, which is essentially the latent heat divided by the radiation density. An attempt for calcul calculation, calculating this. That's, that's the content of the paper. Uh, okay, I had this slide on a uh, two X doublet model uh, by, by, by who? By Stefan and others. Uh, uh, which some time ago, two years ago, bravely pointed out that there was still 
uh, an allowed corner in the alignment limit in the 2x doublet model for, for, for get both large gravitational waves, gravitational wave signal, and enough variance to, to explain the uh, asymmetry in the universe. Now, this corner has since ex been excluded by the latest ACME data in 2018, which improved and essentially moves this blue constraint under, under the uh, uh, bottom line in this graph. graph. And the, why, why this is excluding essentially this opportunity is that these dotted lines here, which dashed lines here, show, uh, show the, uh, the mass correspond to a constant value of the, of the mass of the uh, a pseudoscalar MA, the largest one corresponding to the largest case they were studying corresponds to 487 GeV, very large heavy field. And it so turns out to be that when you the larger MA you pick, you also tend to get very large coupling. You have to use very, very large couplings. In this case, they had very one of the couplings in particular was larger than 2 pi. So getting this direction, moving this direction here, opening up the space requires moving to stronger and stronger and stronger phase transition. And in, when you move this direction, you both get two, typically this is the strength of the transition parameter. Again, I was pointing over, you get the point 15, point 20, something like that. You get very thin walls and, and your perturbative effective action is actually getting unreliable. This was based on one, one loop calculation. So, so that's now that's now perfect introduction, perfect not long introduction to the paper, which is then in the end rather simple. What we did, we studied the same model. We are still using the same, you know, contributing to the same activity with this model. We studied two uh, benchmark points, com and 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 the main thing was to compare different methods of computation for this phase transition parameters. For example, the latent heat divided by the critical temperature cube to the fourth power, which is essentially this uh, phase transition strength parameter. That's one of the parameters that you want to compute. Kim, Kimo, could I, could, I, Kimo, could I ask a question? Sure. A second. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes you've been careful and said effective action, but then very often you write an effective potential. I mean, especially in the, the limit where the wall is very thin, you'd have to worry about high derivative uh, corrections as well as just sure. you know, effective potential. So are you gonna be computing, are you always just gonna be focusing on the effective potential or the full effective action when you'll be doing these later things? I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, use three different methods, effective potential in 4D, effective potential in 3D and the lattice simulations. Uh, uh, yes, and so for instance, when you do the lattice, that's really computing the entire thing, the entire object, the full yes. effect of it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. okay, good. Yeah, Although yeah. you have to be careful when you're saying the full thing, entire thing, and then we'll come back to that. Yes, okay, okay. I know. thank you. Thanks. So, so here, so, so we are using three different methods, as I say, effective potential, dimensionally, three-dimensional effective potential, which uses a dimensional uh, reduction, and, and then loop corrections in, in the three dimension and three dimensional reduction plus lattice calculate simulation. And to me, all these have pros and cons. Of course, everybody knows that the effective potential has the gauge dependence issue. So we are using, uh, uh, of course, Landau gauge. There are infrared divergences due to the uh, magnetic modes of the gauge fields, which persists after ring resumations. And so it's, and also there's in these models, we have rather large couplings, even in these benchmark models, you can see that these physical input parameters transfer into these sets of, of, of uh, MS bar parameters. And you can see that there's rather large couplings in particular, lambda three is still 0.3.66. This is still half of the value used in this GHKN model, but it's, in that, it's still in that direction. Uh, where, and then this three-dimensional effective potential model still suffers from infrared divergences. They are still there because you can't resume the magnetic modes. Uh, and it still suffers from the large, possible large perturbative corrections from large lambdas. Uh, but it doesn't suffer any more from uh, gauge dependence. This is a gauge independent approach. 
but it might actually then suffer from a new problem due to mass hierarchies because dimensional reduction assumes that the high temperature limit is good so that you don't have particles which are you know much heavier than the, the temperature actually or heavier than two pi times temperature for the for it to work and if you look at the lattice we tend to think that the lattice is like you know everything is in case because it still the dimensional reduction suffers from large perturbative corrections and it suffers from possible mass hierarchies because in these models we actually have quite heavy particles of course they are not as heavy during the phase transition and that makes things simpler but they may still be rather heavy and if that is the case again we have problem with the uh, dimensional reduction so and if that breaks and these large couplings can you will have ten, zero minutes at this point. So uh, zero minutes, okay. Oh, I sorry. Okay, so my calculator was showing two minutes, but it was wrong. So, yes. all right. So, then I just very quickly, very quickly go through the results section. It's it's quite okay. So I already said what the problems are, and then I had to have a slide explain the uh, dimension reduction, but. This audience maybe not needed. You understand how you do it, so you have to normalize the dimensional reduction and go, go to the use lattice continuum relations to get the whole you know path from the lattice parameters to the physical parameters. But that's doable. It's just tedious. Yeah, next slide. And then when you go to the lattice simulations, what you do, you calculate these expectation values of the composite op operators with Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo, vary T, temperature, and find this continuity. And you have to use several, several lattice sites to go to the infinite volume and continuum limit. So several simulations are involved. And, and then when you do that, you the results look something like that. For example, if you want to measure phi over t or its lattice equivalent, which is phi two times phi dagger phi over t, you first extrapolate different calculations to the infinite volume limit, and then and then you take those infinite volume limit points and 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 and, and project to the continuum. And here, only thing I want to show is that this benchmark point one, everything looks very nice. Benchmark point two, which has larger couplings, it's many ways more difficult point to, to compute. And you see there is some, it's not so good extrapolation. So the, the accuracy is already starting to get worse there. Similar thing for the latent heat. Benchmark model one, we get the very good estimate. Latent heat is just, I don't explain this because it's a, it can be measured from lattice using again measuring the or just the this bilinears in the in the lattice. Uh, okay, now my my timer says that I have to finish. So uh, the other thing we are using is the effective potential in th in three D three D effective potential, which already has the corrected D by masses from the dimensional reduction. Then you only need to add one loop corrections, which are this, and two loop corrections. This is actually all very simple. Uh, these are very simple integrals. There are just so many of them that the, the bookkeeping is a little bit uh, hard, but uh, otherwise it's quite a straightforward calculation. No more of that. And then there is the thing that everybody, everybody loves and uses 95 or 99 percent of the papers. You just compute your one loop uh, effective potential and Using that one loop effective potential, you compute say latent heat from this formula, and that's it. Here we 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 looked into two different ways of of in, uh, of implementing the resumation, the Parvani method, which replaces the 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 J functions already with the D by masses, uh, and then there's a more consistent way of doing it, the Arnold Espinosa way, where you only dress the zero modes. Uh, they both have pros and cons. This is less consistent, but can be made consistent with renormalization by adding a p-dependent counter terms. Uh, Arnold Espinosa is more consistent, but it fails if you have very heavy particles. They do not decouple automatically. So this, this term overestimates the effect if you have very heavy particles, which start to break the HDL at the high temperature limit. Okay, here are the on second to, la the last 
slide, final results. Uh, here is, for example, phi over t computed uh, in 3D effective potential and then 4D effective potential using either Parvani or Arnold and Spinoza. And uh, if you look at the table here, you can see that if you compare the one loop, uh, the, the effective potential methods, uh, either one loop, either of the one loop, 4D one loop effective potential or the two loop, two loop three dimensional effective potential to the lattice, you find that the two loop effective potential and the lattice rather nicely agree for the ten critical temperature and for the latent heat and also phi C over T. And, and, and yeah, and this, this is essentially the important point of this. Whereas um, in particular in the benchmark two, uh, the effective potential methods start to fail. They actually rather nicely get phi over T and L, but it's the important point is that phi over T and L over TC cubed. So the fact that two loop D effective potential in 3D and 3D lattice agree very well is showing, telling the important thing that there are no significant infrared problems from the magnetic gate signature. That's one uh, solid result from here. Uh, effective potential fails to give accurately this important strength of the transition parameter. To me, it seems that the, uh, the difference between the, uh, this, this may be a little worrisome, Ville, Ville might disagree, but I, I always thought that I, I was seeing a difference between Arnold Espinosa and Parvani in the, in the loop uh, effective potential method may suggest that some of the heaviest fields in the game are starting to break the high temperature limit. And if that is so, then it actually might predict some problems for the accuracy of the dimensional reduction as well. And then uh, also for the accuracy of the 3D and effective potential lattice results, which you won't, wouldn't see from within those two, actually. And then I actually have to finish and here's my summary. Sorry for taking a few minutes or past. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for one question, if there is. Uh, if there is. Can I ask a follow-up question? Is that, sure. is that okay? Go ahead. Um, yeah, so, so I, one thing that worries me about this is you're, you're taking this calculation and then, then computing. I mean, one of the things you really care about is the nucleation temperature. Correct, and then you care about the uh, the properties of the wall, uh, the detailed properties of the wall to do electric barrier analysis, for instance. So, um, regarding the nucleation temperature, um, I mean, my worry is when you have very thin walls uh, that you have to uh, renormalize. You have to use the appropriate thing renormalized on the scale of the wall. In other words, you can't take the effective action defined in the far infrared you have to use an appropriate renormalization scale, which is the wall thickness itself, self-consistently. And so I can imagine that even, you know, imagine there's an order one change between those two things for the bubble action, because the wall is changing, then I get exponentially off as far as the um, tunneling action. And I can be wrong for the nucleation temperature. Can you say why you believe these things are under control? I don't understand why did that the width of the wall is relevant here. Are you talking about the runaway case where you get extremely... I, Sorry, the, the sound I, is breaking I down. I didn't fully yes. understand the question. Well, what I'm saying is there's a scale separation. You know, there's these problems when you have a thin wall define separately a, sep a, a different scale, that scale, that, that length scale, which is the wall, thick, wall thickness, right? And I, really you need... Actually, we are quick going to for the paper, but that is not really relevant for the baryogenesis so much. This model, actually, that I was studying, we were studying, is cannot do baryons at all. We we don't even have CP violation. Oh no, I'm asking we a question. I'm, fair whether enough. you can get the strength fair parameter enough. correct. No, 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 fair enough. No, 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 no. Fair enough. I mean, I, I agree. I understand, but I'm asking a question of principle. So, in principle, you do care about details of the wall. Right, and so there the question is: is what uh, what length scale do you need to consider oh. the the effective action? To and I've and I've always been confused about this. Um, it sh should be surely, you know, in the case of very thin walls, to get accurately the nucleation temperature and to accurately understand electric baryogenesis, you need to define not the usual effective action, but an effective action that's. Yeah, let's but see that's. I, 
I agree. But that's one step along the way. I was all of what I was saying in this last part of the talk concerned this box here. How well can we compute the quantities L, T, Z, whatever, which yes. eventually you will have to use in these and which then flow down here into the, the definition of these parameters, predictions of computational wall velocities and in yes, the yes, thickness yes. of the wall, all yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. But, but I was still just here. Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. I was asking a follow-up yeah. question. Okay, I'll, I'll be quiet. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we move to the next talk.